Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa. I'm Clarisse Fortuné. First, the headlines on the continent and beyond. Curfew ends in North Kivu and Ituri. The two Congolese provinces are to get back to civilian administration after more than two years of state of siege imposed by President Chisekedi. People are still missing in Cameroon following a deadly landslide which left at least 30 dead last weekend. And to the Middle East crisis, Egypt condemns the Israeli army's decision to tell some one million people in Gaza to evacuate. Let's start with the Democratic Republic of Congo. President Félix Tshisekedi announced the end of restrictions in two of its provinces, North Kivu and Ituri, two conflict-hit areas where a state of siege has been enforced for two years. Curfew will be lifted and people will be allowed to demonstrate, to demonstrate peacefully. The state of siege was imposed in 2021 in order to suppress unrest in the region. Let's hear from people on the ground. It's disappointing because the state of siege was established in 2021 with the aim of ending the war. It's deplorable that what we've seen instead is a resurgence of several rebel groups in the province. Some territories are still under M23 terrorist occupation, and in Ichuri province, the Kadeko militia continues to sow terror. This is a timely decision. We live under this for over two years. All demonstrations were banned. We are really very happy to continue our political activism. This measure is beneficial. The protests we had planned were cancelled. But now we are free to demonstrate or express our political opinions. And we mentioned yesterday the allegations of sexual abuse against eight members of the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC. The UN said it was taking action against the members to be detained. And the authorities in the DRC have announced they would be opening an investigation. Caroline Lemberley reports. Another stain on the reputation of the Blue Helmets, this time in the DRC. The UN said this week that it was taking action against several peacekeepers in response to reports of serious misconduct. The peacekeepers who are facing allegations of sexual abuse are reported to have been detained. Upon receiving information that contingent members from the UN peacekeeping force in the DRC deployed at a base in the eastern part of the country were fraternizing after curfew hours, at an out-of-bounds bar known to be a place where transactional sex occurs. Uh, the UN mission's military police and conduct and discipline personnel visited the premises to assess the reports they had received. He said UN mission personnel attempted to detain the contingent members who physically assaulted and threatened them. The peacekeepers, whose nationality has not been confirmed by the UN, were stationed at a base near Beni in the country's east. The MONUSCO mission, as it's known, took over from an earlier UN peacekeeping mission in 2010 to help stamp out insecurity in the East, where several rebel groups are active. Last month, DRC President Felix Chisikedi asked MONUSCO to start packing up before the end of the year, amid rising anger at its perceived failure to help stem insecurity. The government had previously agreed to a withdrawal starting from December 2024. It's far from the first time that a UN peacekeeping mission faces allegations of sexual misconduct. Scandals have emerged in DR Congo, Haiti and the Central African Republic, where an entire unit comprised of 60 members was repatriated as recently as this summer, following allegations against 11 of its members. Staying in DR Congo, Stanis Bujakera went on trial today in Kinshasa on suspicion of spreading false information. The reporter who works for Reuters and Jeune Afrique magazine was detained last month following an article which suggested that Congolese military intelligence had killed opposition politician Cherubin Okende the month before. The article, which was unsigned, was based on an alleged confidential memo from a separate intelligence agency. Congolese authorities have said the memo is a fake. Burkina Faso and Russia have agreed to sign a nuclear power deal. The construction of a power plant in Burkina Faso should increase the energy supply by 2030 in a country where less than a quarter of the population has access to electricity. It is the latest move by Burkina's military rulers to strengthen ties with Moscow as the country looks to diversify its international allies following a coup last year. 
the only nuclear power plant on the African continent, is near Cape Town in South Africa. And now the latest on Cameroon. People are still missing on the outskirts of Yaoundé following a deadly landslide which left at least 30 dead. Many families are now homeless and sleeping out in the open while awaiting help from the government. In Yaoundé, our correspondents report Indira Ayuk and Pamela Nguno. Prayers on the edge of a giant's crater. This has become a daily ritual for these women praying for the souls of those killed in a landslide. Further below, we catch a glimpse of what is left of the 20 or so homes that stood here a few days ago. I lived over there. Yannick is a 32-year-old bricklayer who lived in this neighborhood for about 20 years. He lost everything and now just wants to find the body of his wife who was pregnant with their first child. I lost my father, my mother, one of my brothers, my uncle, my niece and my pregnant wife. I'm still searching for my wife's body. The surgeon water took away Karine's house. She settled here 23 years ago and now sleeps in the open with her family because she can't afford the taxi fare to the accommodation center. My younger sister and I are currently homeless. We spend the night wherever we happen to be once night falls. If it's raining, I ask for shelter from those whose houses are still standing. But even if she could afford it, the temporary accommodation centre set up by the Yaoundé 2 Council is too small to shelter all those in need. We hurriedly set up this accommodation centre for homeless families so that they can have a roof over their heads and have a place to sleep while waiting for possible resettlement. Disasters like this are common in Cameroon, especially during the rainy season. Four years ago in Guache, in the west region of the country, 43 people died in a similar landslide. And now to Senegal, Ousmane Sonko will be able to contest next year's presidential race. The jailed opposition leader is to be reinstated on the electoral lists, according to a judge. Mr. Sonko's name was struck off after he was handed a two-year jail sentence in August for morally corrupting a young person. He denies the allegation. Government lawyers said they would appeal against the ruling. And we now are near day eight of the latest Israel-Hamas war. Israel has demanded that some one million civilians evacuate northern Gaza for their own safety in anticipation of an expected invasion. Such a move would be a grave violation of international humanitarian law, says Egypt, Egypt, where Secretary of State Antony Blinken is due to visit. Fraser Jackson is our correspondent in Washington. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on a whirlwind trip of the Middle East at the moment, and the United States has three main aims from this trip. The first is to stop this conflict from spilling out over the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip. The second is to try and secure American hostages who have been taken by the Hamas terrorist group. And the third is to open some sort of humanitarian corridor in the south of Gaza Strip along the border with Egypt. And it is with that aim that that Tony Blinken heads to Egypt this weekend. Now, the United States is trying to get those American citizens who were trapped inside Gaza along with their families as well as other civilians to be able to cross the land border into Egypt. However, so far, Egypt has been somewhat hesitant. They want to open the border as a one-way border, allowing humanitarian aid, food and medicine to flow into the Gaza Strip. However, after Israel ordered the 1.1 million Gazans to head further south, the pressure on that border will be growing and it remains to be seen whether the Egyptian government will give in to the U.S.'s demands and open that border for civilians to flee the conflict. Fraser Jackson reporting there from the White House. Now a word of sports with the Rugby World Cup. South Africa will face France this Sunday. South Africa have picked Corbus Renard and Mani Libok for the quarterfinal. Renac will face Antoine Dupont as his opposite number after the France's captain's return from a fractured cheekbone. Head coach Jack Nienebert says the number nine is better suited to dealing with the French kicking game. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, there's not a lot of um, 
weaknesses in the French side uh, and in all, all, all four teams that's playing this weekend. Uh, the one thing that's probably a, a little bit different uh, uh, of the French side is, is their kicking game. Uh, and I think they, uh, even in, in one of their press conferences, they made no bones about it that they, they prefer not to play with the ball. You and we'll all be watching. Well, that's it for this edition of Eye on Africa. Thank you for watching. Save with France 24 for more news.